Mike Chadwick, we meet again. We do, sir. How are you? Very well. What was it? About a year and a half ago, we had a bit of a, a conundrum where I thought I was coming on your podcast. You thought we were coming on mine. We had a chat. And then, without being too pernickety about it, the, the, the audio setup wasn't where it needed to be. Yeah, I've leveled up, mate. I've, um, I... So I had I basically thought I was coming on your podcast and was just as I always do just absolutely winging it and then whilst we're talking you we start talking about you being on my podcast and I was like shit I don't actually have a podcast but let's roll with it so we we went with it anyway good to have you uh, back on properly so I remember before when we spoke I gave you the opportunity to introduce yourself to anyone listening that doesn't know who you are who are you uh, so as you kindly said I'm Mike Chadwick I'm a former paratrooper special forces support group operator Royal Army physical training corps instructor I've recently left the military I'm now a little bit of an entrepreneur full-time coach and now an author randomly enough we're going to get into those accolades impressive accolades as they are but first of all I just want you to explain to people uh, the impact that you made when it came to the kind of military process of you know succeeding with their physical training and the things that you implemented just so people can get a background of kind of where you initially I suppose started gaining gravitas in in the industry yeah so I um I actually everything I've ever done in the military has been done through mishaps and misfortune poor management etc and I've just landed in a place whereby I've just I've run at it and um, one of those was becoming a physical training instructor um one year I didn't get a report that's like a big no-no in the military so I ended up they pulled me into an office and said what do you want so I said PTI course being in the parachute regiment where everyone's fit it's the most difficult thing to get on um, so I got it anyway then I had a little bit of a falling out with one of with my boss and I got sent up to the infantry training centre to become a parachute regiment PTI and I thought I'm not sitting still got myself on the degree fell in love with the process and just ran at it head first since then and um, subsequently got selected for the Royal Army Physical Training Corps and then I just bounced around the country just upskilling, redesigning and redeveloping training programs um, and yeah things caught on and things just things just moved really really fast mate I started um, uh, really taking note when I moved up to the Army Foundation College where I tripled the parachute regiment pass rate I had the highest P company pass rate since World War Two, and then um, mitigated injuries and, and I just started I was winning a load of accolades a load of awards it was a lovely time um, and I just loved him I, I, the most important thing was I fell in love with the process and I think that's what made made life a little bit easy for me would it be fair to say that the previous way of doing things was like archaic it was old like what kind of what kind of things were you looking at and going what the hell is this uh, yeah, so I mean, the famous saying in the army is, yeah, but we've always done it this way. Um, so when I went through basic training and no one thought that this isn't okay, where it's, I think out of 60, 60 odd people started, there was nine originals. And if you think of that from a business point of view, value for money, that's awful. And so only when I started really delving into the physical side of life and I became the most boring cunt you've ever, even, ever can ever imagine, I just fully invested all my time and energy into reading about the body and then just trying to implement theory into practice the following day i was in full-time uni so i'm getting all of this knowledge but i'm still in the system that's archaic from like years and years ago and then you just got this like i was i was started to climb the ranks then as soon as i went into the physical training so i had a life and i've got you've got this gobshite young lad saying i think we can do it a little bit differently why don't we try it this way and as you can imagine, that, that fell on deaf's ears straight away. And then results spark confidence, and it still does. So I said, someone gave me a chance. It worked very well. Um, and then all of a sudden, people start going on. Like people start winning MBEs a little bit higher up. And then, uh, you know, you start getting a little bit more of a chance, a little bit more of a people, higher people's ears. And, and you start moving forward. But yeah, it was absolutely archaic. And it, it, was, it was just volume, volume, volume. And obviously, the injury... Uh, and the retention rate was ridiculous it was so low I can imagine like uh, everyone you, in the in the military you've got your ranks but there's also a hierarchy in anywhere anywhere you look at and you could look at Jordan Peterson's dominance hierarchy or you could look at you know even in the corporate world 
But what I kind of always try and express to people is being creative or going against the grain is so difficult in your early 20s because you're not at the rank or the pay grade to do it. So I, I've i always been like a creative person, but I've always been in low paying jobs. So when I was on a 20K base salary or 25K base salary, if I'm like the junior guy in the sales department, I'm like, hey guys, I think we could do this. They're like, shut the fuck up. You're a fucking 25 year old. You're on 22K a year. You've got a maximum 2K bonus. We don't want to hear what you got to fucking say. So I can imagine you like Lance Corporal, Corporal, be like, excuse me, Captain, sir. Um, I think that we, and they're like, you're a fucking Lance Corporal. How about you shut the fuck up? You know, like, <laughs> so I, I don't think people can quite, quantify or grasp the uphill battle it would have been to have to talk up ranks to try and get these things changed oh mate it was hideous but i, I mean you but getting your shit together and leveling up is a lonely is a lonely world anyway um so fight once it's the moment you start going against the grain and, and as what you do on social media every single day mate you you, you you're fighting uphill battles anyway and you, oh, fuck, I'm, I'm in anyway i'm fighting anyway i may as well go all the way um and most important, I believed in it. I believed in what I was saying. I believed in the research. I wanted to follow the science. And then all of a sudden I had the proof that it was working. And you know, and then all of a sudden you get these little pockets of hierarchy going, let's give them an opportunity, but let's try it, let's try it. And the problem was, and I said this out loud, which didn't help me, is that the people writing policy and determining physical development in the military at one point was those who got themselves fit back in the 90s those who could run a really fast mile and a half and I was like this is fucking wrong all of a sudden there's like guys coming through with degrees and master's degrees I'm sure there was a study in Sandhurst where like 70% of some because it's the most easiest degree to get being sports science most of was Sandhurst that, that a sports science degree I, I mean I've got one so that is the easiest um, but yeah most most of the people in Sandhurst had a, had a sports science degree and then the, but the actual people writing policy just ran really quick when it comes to injury, I think everyone, especially maybe it's more of a British thing. Uh, I've had so many friends that are like, oh, I was in the army. I'm like, oh yeah, what regiment were you in? Well, did you serve? And they're like, oh no, because uh, basically I had asthma, so I couldn't be in the army. Or they're like, oh, I tore my meniscus in training. There's a lot of people that kind of went through the training process and they were continually put out. Even like David Goggins, am I right in thinking that he was uh, continually injured in the process of becoming a Navy SEAL? Yeah, so... The David Goggins model is is a difficult one. I, this is one of the things I talk talk about in the book, um, and it, it's in regards to willpower. So David Goggins talks about he, he's constantly moving forward, and he's like, "Let's just fucking go. It doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter how, how much it hurts. We just keep going. We keep going. We keep going." And that's all well and good with his injury history and his thirty plus years of special forces. So his training age is ridiculous. So, you know, the the injury rate in the army is ridiculous and it's all to do with what I call junk mileage it's doing the shitty things that you don't need to do the best thing we can do and my whole philosophy on it is let's do less but more specific the minimal effective dose and you know saying that to people when they're going oh the pass rates are down incredibly low and you want to do less so what they, their, their, their plan was originally was oh it's not working let's do more oh it's not working let's do more oh let's add more miles let's do more let's do more and it's like when you strip it all back it's just a load of shit you know 25 shit sessions are so much more worse than five structured really specific to individual sessions even if you put that in a military context if you're sending 10,000 men to battle and only 500 come back injured you're like oh don't send 20,000 maybe you send them to the wrong place doing the wrong thing you know it's like maybe we send 500 around the flanks and see what happens you know let's mix it up a bit let's not just keep putting you know it's almost like a it is sunk cost fallacy that like, oh well we've been doing it this way we can't just give it up it's been getting people through the ranks for so long and I the, I, an, the Yanks are still doing that I think I think the Yanks I are still they're still going off that model mate don't make this political I saw uh, <laughs> I saw uh, have you have you heard about that uh, train crash in Ohio no so there's a train in Ohio in America in a place called East Palestine that derailed and loads of these toxic chemicals have been uh, released so they decided to do uh, a controlled burn. And it's almost, they're calling it America's Chernobyl. Let me, uh, I'm going to quickly Google it. I've got Jamie here. Train Ohio uh, derail. I'm just going to do this on my phone. Because no one, uh, all the people I've spoken to about it. So I'm going to show you a picture there. That's that's like a plume of smoke in their hometown. But then loads of people have been reporting that their animals are dying. 
So they're like pet chickens are dead. There are loads of dead fish in the uh, rivers. People have been throwing rocks into the rivers and there's all these like contaminated colored chemicals coming out. But no one's really talking. Oh, right, yeah. So do you I have seen it? that. Do you see it on TikTok? Yeah, yeah. I've seen it yeah. Yeah, all over social media, yeah. So uh, Trump has gone to Ohio, boots on the ground, to start handing out rations to people whilst Biden has gone to Ukraine to give Ukraine more money. And they're like... Biden is in Ukraine giving, this is an American thing, they're like, Biden's in Ukraine giving your money to the Ukrainians. And then there goes Trump's in Ohio giving his money to the Americans. And it's very easy, or it's very convenient how they're using these different political agendas from things that are occurring in the world. So the whole military, and we will get back to uh, you in a second, the whole military political combination uh, for elections is actually probably the main reason that I never... Uh, ended up in the army because I was an army cadet. I was a corporal. I was like, I think I was like 16 or whatever. And I was, I said to you before, I wanted to join uh, Remy. And then it was that point that I wanted to go in as an officer, tried to go into Welbeck College, had a misdemeanor, let's say, when I was younger that prevented me from going through. And then I didn't have grades strong enough to wing it. But it was just as the Afghanistan war was going on. And I'll never forget my parents being like, it wasn't a war to them. It was a political chess piece. And it was yeah. in some respects that real people with real families and real, you know, real real men and women were being used as pawns on the battlefield. And yeah, did it, in your experience in your time in the army, did you ever feel like it, 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 it felt like that? Because I have such respect for the military and the personnel and all realms of it. But sometimes I'm like, I wonder how it feels to be on the other side. How did it feel? Because how long did you serve in the army for? Or the Paris? Uh, I joined uh, early 2007. I left just under two years ago now. So, um, I, I'm at, you know, most of most of my life actually. But um, do you know what? I didn't. I I joined the military um, not for Queen and Country. I didn't join for any political. Didn't have a clue. I left school um, and I literally joined the army to put food on the table for my little sister. That's why I did it. So whatever they threw at me, whatever they wanted me to do, I was in anyway. So. It, and even when I went out to Africa, and even when I went out, whenever I've been away, I never felt like that. I just had a job to do. In any other walk of life, is what you what you would do in your walk of life. What you do, what I do now in my job, I had a job to do, and I took orders and I did it to my best, best the best of my ability. And that was that was the bottom line of me being a soldier. They they effectively gave me everything. You know, the the military's been wonderful for me. It's gave me it's gave me a great platform to go and develop for other people, but. I didn't actually think of anything political. I was young, obviously. I'm very, very, very young back then. So, um, in the consideration, the grand scheme of things, the bigger picture, I think more now. I think more in depth now, as you do, um, as you've just as you've just been speaking about it. Then, but back then, mate, I was just um, I did my job to the best of my ability. And I think that's an amazing thing for the amount of people. Where I suppose for, for myself, growing up, probably yourself as well. When when your grades aren't good and your career prospects are looking pretty dim, they're like, right. Do you know your way around a rifle? Do you, do you like do you like hanging with the boys? You know, do you, could you go away for long periods of time? And it's almost incredible that there is such a, a massive industry that people can go and become disciplined, become upskilled, get educated, uh, or even just to ignite the spark of education in people. And like you say, you kind of get looked after to that point. So I, hats off. And I always, it's such an interesting thing. I, I don't know if this is just a bias, but like the British military, I like you know they're badass and i think that's because we got the gurkhas to be honest you know that's that's what makes probably makes you the most feared army in the world is that right would you say that or is, uh, is there is there a military above us what's your gurkha demographic mate i'm like I'm all i remember all i remember when i was younger so uh my sister used to uh like partake in this like uh i think it was called like pony club something like that she rode horses when she was younger and um I, I used to get in so much trouble that when I was like maybe 13, 14, I wasn't allowed to uh, basically be left on my own because I'd have house parties and stuff. So my mum and dad made me go along to this like horse event where my sister was riding and I had to stay over. And a load of gypsies like just took over a field next door to a massive uh, group of young 16-year-old girls uh, that were at this pony club event. And I think it was in like Farnborough or Ald- Aldershot, somewhere like that. So the police came and the police were like, look, we can't just evict them. There's some kind of rule where you're allowed to uh, per- permit people to stay on mm. something for 24 hours. I can't remember. 
But they were like, don't worry, there's a Gurkhas regiment down the road. We're going to send some Gurkhas. So, um, and, and Gurkhas are from Nepal. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So you've got these Nepalese, British uh, military, uh, you know, regiment. And they come along and they sent like four. And I remember saying to my dad, I was like, four's not enough. And my dad was like, four is more than enough. Yeah. And I get chatting to these guys and I was like, they, they have that blade, the sheath on the belt. And one yeah. of them said, was saying to Cochrane, me, they're not. I think it's called. All right, yeah, Cochrane, there you go. This is why, this year, the expert. Then you could, it's not allowed to go back in. They tell me if it's true. It's not allowed to go back in without blood on it. True, very true. So, so this is all I meant. I remember this for a long time ago. And I'll never Dangerous. forget. I went for a pee and piss in the middle of the night and I, I didn't hear a thing and there's just a flashlight in my face. And he was like, he was checking on me. And I was like, whoa, I was I'm 14 years old. I was like, there's ninjas in the British army. So ever since then, anyone says like, oh, you know, these are bad boys. I'm like, you don't know about Gurkhas. You know many of them? Yeah, no, I, yeah. So there's, 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 funnily enough, there's quite a few Gurkhas attached to the parachute regiment. So I've always worked, I've always been close with it, close with the Gurkhas. Um, I coach some of them now who want to go on to bigger and better things. So I, I have a close relationship with them. They're, they're very good. They, they know exactly what they do. That their, their admin is incredible. Um, and that's all, der- it's, it's derived from their basic training. From their, it's, they're so proud to go and serve in that unit. And I think that's the difference between, especially in the British military, about you just being so proud of where you're from and who you're serving for. Um, and they have that in abundance, mate. So they are they, they, But that is so. That is very true about the about the cookery. Once that gets pulled, blood must be blood must be taken. <laughs> That's so sick. Roof, I wish we. It? I wish yeah. I wish the British had something other than that. They're like, what you got? We're like, oh, you know, we got Yorkshire puddings. We got toad in the old. <laughs> That's what we got as far as British culture. <laughs> uh, so let's rewind it back. And it's it's great that you're saying about doing less can sometimes bring more to people. I think that to the more general listener, I I started a program recently where I was like. I, my, my weight training has just fallen by the side with jiu-jitsu so I've got a whiteboard in the gym and I wrote down my initial training sessions and I looked at them and I was like this is pathetic but I was like surely undercooking it is always going to benefit me more than overcooking it because if I come out of that session the next day I'm not too sore fine but if I'm so sore that it writes me off for another two days it's not and slowly by slowly I've been creeping up the reps the sets and if I do a set, I sometimes rub out something on the board and I just let myself know that next week I do another set or I let myself know next week that needs to be a bit harder. And it's such a nicer way of getting into things because if I did a session and it just smashed me, it'd be very easy mm-hmm. to let my subconscious let me train a lot less. Like, yeah. it seems so counterintuitive, but I see so many people that are doing too much. How, how was that initial process and the results of getting people to do less when it started rolling out? And... Um, initial process it was obviously it was met with you know jeers and you know people old old boys coming at me with stakes and stuff but it, it was you know there's two things in from a physical development standpoint you've got availability and you've got sustainability availability which is what i wanted so i wanted to ensure that every soldier was readily available for every single session if i could do that then i've got a hundred sessions as opposed to smashing them for five and then they've on the sick for 95 sessions hundred specific sessions I was like that is incredible can you imagine doing that for any athlete for any normal human being give, give me a hundred sessions with you hundred hours of training you know so availability was the first and you can only get that through a foundation of strength so I basically coined the term you've earned the right to a thrashing uh, and in the military you get thrashed and rightly so because you grow in those tough times but I said let's provide a foundation of strength let's just do a little bit go back to pro- an at proper S&C as if, we're in a, as if we're at a football club proper strength conditioning lifting heavy weights building muscle mass around the joints they're most likely to get injured making them stronger and then we can thrash the fuck you do whatever you want to do you can throw whatever you want at them because they'll never break and that was my plan it was make them solid and sustain and, and then the next part is, is sustainability as you just rightly said if you go and smash yourself in your gym and then all of a sudden you're rolling the following day and you're in you're just going to get turned over. You're going to get. It's going to be an awful time for you, isn't it? So, and it's like what I do. I work with some MMA, MMA athletes as well. Um, uh, some some on the on in the biggest organization in the world. And the most important thing for them, and I say this all the time, is their tactical and technical ability. So I split development up into physical, psychological, tactical, and technical. What you do on the mats is the single most important thing to get better on the mats. Do your sport. 
everything we do from a physical and psychological point of view, the psychological giving you the right kick up the arse at the right time, the right numbers in the right place. The physiological side is only to enhance that tactical and technical. So we have to minimize that to provide them sp- and, and get the biggest bang for our book. So it's about doing as minimal as possible, getting the biggest bang for your book in order to be better in the tactical and technical side of life. So when you're on your whiteboard, everything you do is to get better on the mats. And that's what I did in the military. Everything I do was to be better at soldiering in the minimal amount of way. You think of boiling a kettle, uh, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, I think is boiled. Um, 100 degrees is class as boiled. You can continue to boil a kettle, but boiled is boiled. You know, anything over that, you're just consuming resources that could be used elsewhere. Get what you need to do and go home. And then what we'll do is we'll then go and thrive in the tactical and technical side because we're going to be available. We've got a sustainable program because we're not in absolute shit state. Um, your body's not for, for failing, yeah? So, and that's the way I wanted to run with it. Me trying to explain that to some 50-year-old dinosaur, though, is... is you know, I'm using big words there, so you know it. It can get quite scary, but oh, I mean, I got given a chance, and as I said before, results spark confidence. I then got a bigger chance and a bigger chance, and before long, I was writing programs on the big stage. So, um, it does work, and that's that's exactly how I do things now. From what I did to a junior soldier at 16 in the Army Foundation College, I do to a UFC athlete now. Exactly the same principles. It's still so frowned upon because even one thing I love about jiu-jitsu is I can dial back the intensity. I can still hit all my training sessions, but if I'm really run down, I can dial back. And if I've got like a little bit of a niggle, sometimes my thoracic or my neck will be fucked. So then I'll just lay on my back. As soon as I start around, I just lay on my back with my feet and my arms in the air. And people are like, what are you doing? I'm like, mate, I've got sore neck. And if I just, all I've got to do is keep people away from my neck. But when you're in like, say the army and people are like, right, one mile run, you you fucking maggots, you're going to be running this one mile in fucking under seven. You're like, anyone runs this in over 10 minutes, you're going to be fucking change parade. Like, that's the kind of like mentality that I can only imagine there's out there. So if someone's really beaten up, he's not going to go, uh, excuse me, Staff Sergeant, I've got really bad doms. They're going to be like, you, you fucking got what? Pussy, get down, give me a hundred. You know, like, so you, you need to be able to give people that ability to dial back and the people to say, look, I'm not, I'm not able to do that. And, I even uh, joined like a group fitness gym uh, locally last year and I turned up to some sessions and I was like, look, I'm, I'm just doing the weights today. And people looking at me and I was like, I'm just doing the weights. Anything more than just weights, if I do this wad with you guys, it's counterintuitive. I'm stealing yeah. energy from the next five days. Like, and a few other people were looking at me, but they just didn't have the bravery to say it out loud themselves. And people yeah. need to have that, that switch in them where they can go, nah, not not necessarily that I'm taking the whole day off, but I'm not doing as much. Or I'm going to the gym. Oh, I've got five five different exercises, four sets of exercise. Say, so, hey, I'm just going to do two sets. And I'm going to do it half intensity. And people don't have that. And it seems so counterintuitive that people sometimes work too hard towards their goals. And that that's because you've got knowledge though. Can you imagine doing that in the military? To people like me who joined and I had no idea about anything to do with training. I just so happened to have a little bit of a... I was lucky. A little bit of genetics and stuff. And genetics take you so far. You know, I made sure. I couldn't deadlift. I couldn't ah. deadlift 100 kilograms when I was 21. Like, so at 21, I could not tell you how to deadlift. And like you say, it's the knowledge thing. I think I always had the strength. I just never had the knowledge. And yeah, back then, back then, like 10 years ago, just over, it was very difficult to find the resources to learn this kind of stuff. And looking back now, like so now I look at someone and it's hard to go oh this this is a full grown man who doesn't know how to deadlift and then I go you were a full grown man yeah. that didn't know how to deadlift <laughs> yeah it's, and, it, and it's the same and you and I go back to those um, as I mentioned before about the nine originals when I went through training um, we had no idea we just literally there were some sessions mate where it'd be like no one's leaving we're not stopping until two of you ring the bell and I'd just be going, I'd just be in whatever position it was, whatever exercise it was, thinking, I just fucking wish someone would ring the bell. I had no idea what I was doing. I, I just held on for dear life. I got very, very lucky. Well, most people failed because they got injured because their bodies physically couldn't handle it. They didn't have availability. They couldn't sustain the process, as I mentioned before. Um, and, and that happens, and that's across every walk of life. And you get that now in every single gym setting you can think of. And only because you got that education that you can pull yourself apart and go, actually, 
if I go and do that absolutely ridiculous wad that someone's just taken off Instagram, it's probably going to affect my ability to, to go on the mats tomorrow, which is what I actually want to go and do. It leaves a lot of people feeling uh, very beaten up, very sore, and as if they're not cut out for it, which is the last thing you want. Um, so let's talk about the audiobook that you released in June. Mm-hmm. That's right, yeah. So what was, talk to me about the purpose, the principles. Uh, did I see there was, is Staz, on, I looked at the credits for it, Staz and Aunt Middleton, have they per, like contributed to it? Yeah, so the, the idea behind it was, um, when I did the, the deal for the book, we did an exclusive deal for an audio book. And I was like, right, okay, so um, I've studied a lot of sports psychology. I understand how to talk to people and get the most out of the room and then um, how long it's going to take before people are switching off, etc. So I thought, right, people don't, it'd be very difficult for me to try and talk about what I want to talk about um, without bringing in a different voice. So the idea behind it was that I was going to provide you with some sort of principle of training, uh, for example, strength. And I was going to go, here's my philosophy. Here's how I got it. Here's the science. If you don't believe me, here's the world's strongest brothers talking to me about it. So then at the end of each chapter, it'd be like, here's me talking about real life situations. So I talk to the world's strongest brothers. When I go into mental resilience, I talk to the boys from special forces boys. Um, I talk about willpower and fighting through. And I talk to my mate who got blown up in Afghan and how the thought process applies to real life. Um, and you know, and I have Staz where we talk about the same and how the principles align with business as well. And then Staz is obviously doing very, very well uh, with his through dark stuff. And you know, and then Ant Middleton's on there talking. You know, so I've got loads of special forces guys. There's some doctors talking about nutrition. Um, and you know, it was really, really, it was really good, mate. So I wanted basically to have a different opinion. I wanted a different voice, um, and it ended up being really cool, mate. I, I utilize the same process you're doing now on Riverside, and it was. Um, I really, really enjoyed it, mate. Pulling that. And one of the most one of the most incredible things about it was that at the end of each mini podcast, um, so at the end of the book, you can listen to everyone's full podcast within the book. It's snippets. So at the end, we talk about it and it's broken up into so bite-sized chunks. And um, and at the end uh, of each podcast, each thirty minutes conversation, I asked every athlete at the elite at the elite end and said, "So where do you go now?" And my final chapter is where do we go from here? And I was thinking, I wanted to ask the question. And every person, without me pushing them, without me, there's no notes. I made sure there was absolutely nothing sent to them. I said, this is going to be raw. I want raw opinion. I want it to be raw. Um, like we're doing now. And every single person used the word dominance. And I was like, that's incredibly powerful. You've got these people who are at the elite end. You know, so there's UFC athletes in there. Um, top 10 UFC athletes. There's special forces operators from the, toughest military in the world as you mentioned and all of them are talking about dominance the world's strongest man is not happy with one one gold he went and won the second shortly after um and now he doesn't want he wants more he wants dominance i was like it's so powerful mate that everyone's aligned on that so it was a really cool process mate and that's why i brought the that's why i brought the special guests on you know it's um it, it it's almost a word that has so many negative connotations because so many people associate it with like a male driven uh, dominance over women or a male dominance tyranny over the corporate world or finances or wealth or you know where race or any of these things it's always linked with like dominance and oppression but dominance is like a key driving force behind motivation for both men and women and 100%. I think it's it, it's such, it sounds like a dirty topic but I would 100% relate to that that there is this Jordan Peterson dominance hierarchy but like it's the key point behind wanting to win and competitiveness and competitiveness even sometimes you know I love playing Call of Duty all right I'll be honest with you I was supposed to be doing a lot of work yesterday I had four Warzone wins in a day yesterday right what well, well, why why didn't you just win once and then put the controller down because I wanted to ruin the day for loads of kids I, you know, you want I dominance. want to I want to snatch victory from people. I take satisfaction from knowing someone else somewhere in Australia had second, third flash up on their screen, and it was because of me. So it's it's that and the, the the dominance thing. So it can seem like such an evil thing, but when you look at dominance in say the capitalistic business mindset, it's that you want to win the market share so that you can earn money, so you can bring it home, and you can provide for a family or your friends or your loved ones. It's even if we if i was to boil this back down to like hunter gatherer mentality you're the ones that go out to forage so you can come back and fatten up your family it's 
it comes from a place of virtue and a place for love. It's not about oppressing other people, especially not men oppressing women, if anything. So much of, I think, the, the only coming from experience, the, the collective amount of dominance amongst males, predominantly, not all males, I think is from that kind of genetic understanding that they can go away, compete competitively, win resources, bring them back and look after their children and their, and their wives. And now some people are going to think that's a sexist remark, but that's why I think we have this hardwired, and I could be wrong. And that's not. why we're, we're linked to like, yeah, I'll say it just in case, in case the left come. I think that's, that's why so many people have this connection with dominance, but they almost don't even use the word out loud because they're scared of the connotations of it. Fuck that. Man, I, every time I bring someone on for my tier one coaching now, I'd sit down and have a 30 minute phone call with them. And I am, all I want to do, and I, and you know, all I want to do is win. I'm ruthless in winning. All I want to do in life is win. And when I do these 30 minute calls, I'm not interested in their physical ability right now. I'm interested, the crazier the aim, the better. So I get people from all sorts of tactical populations around the world now where people come to me and go, I want to join the Belgium Special Forces or I want to be specialist, uh, I want to do firearms uh, in the Australian police or New Zealand Special, whatever it looks like. I'm like, fucking hell, I'm in. 100%, the crazier the better. But the most important thing I'm looking for is people with that mindset. I'm not there to make numbers up. I'm here to fucking dominate and win. And that's exactly what I'm, and the moment people start talking like that, I'm fully in on it. And I, and I explain to them as well. I'm, I'm like, listen, a lot of people don't need me in their life. They really don't because I am fully in on winning. And if you give me an aim, your aim becomes our aim and I will do anything to go and achieve that. And that a lot of people don't need that in their life. I'm too much for them. I said, but if you align with that, I'll be your best asset and we will go and win together. And that's fundamentally why I've got the highest pass rate across every arduous course in the country is because of that mindset. And it's... And, you know, and the left will hate it, but it's five, so I'm fully in on, it. and that's why I was successful. Because unfortunately, and, and we, you use the I use men again, grown men are getting weaker. They are, and they don't want to dominate anymore because it's frowned upon, as you've just said. And it's I'm thinking, well, there's a space in the market there. It's it's interesting as well. Like, let's say you lose the example of the Belgian special forces. Say you've got Dave from Belgium wants to be an armed response. Why does he want to be an armed response? Because he wants to keep the place safe. He wants to ensure that if anyone, whether mental illness, terrorism, whatever, steps out on the street, that he can put himself in harm's way and, and deter that. He also wants to climb to the highest rank possible so he can use responsibility, earn a good salary, come home, probably in most cases provide for a family to ensure that his kids, you know, can don't have to save for a car. His kids don't have to get, you know, all of these things. But we, we kind of take it at point value that, oh, this, this person, if they want to dominate, they want to have everything for themselves. And I just... Even I hate this mentality that we have towards people that are successful. People that have a lot of money often employ a lot of people. People that have a lot of money often pay the most tax. And then we will straight away we'll go, oh, but Amazon, oh, but Uber, oh, but these. But then you're using such a fraction of a percentile of businesses. And I'll never forget, I had a very wealthy client when I was PTing on the floor. And I, I kind of was saying to him, like, you know, you get a few tax breaks as a face-to-face -face PT. And he like put his hand on my hand. He looks me in the eyes and he goes, James, if you're not paying real tax, you're not paying, you're not earning real money. And I was like, yeah, fair play, fair play. So like, I think it's like you say, men are getting weaker because we're no longer cherishing this dominance and domination mentality for, for men or women. And I think that is what's making us weaker. It's because we need competition. We need people to ultimately lose because those people that came second place in Warzone will wake up today with a fire in their belly to ensure it doesn't happen again. Hopefully. 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 But most people will, in this day and age, in 2023, will roll over and go, I'm happy with that, James. I really want to congratulate you. Because if that was me, <laughs> mate, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Tomorrow, you better be logged. And if you don't log on, I'm on your Instagram. I'm, I'm going to open a new account and heckle you, mate, to death. As long as I, I want to get you back. And that, that's the way I go. Have you heard the um, the... I think it's a poem. It might be a poem. It might just be a saying. It's called Those Remain by Michael Pop for something. Right? It's like, uh, my granddad drove 10 miles to work. My dad drove five. I now drive a Cadillac. My son drives a Mercedes. My grandson drives a Ferrari. But my great-grandson will walk again. And it's all to do with tough times create strong men. And strong men create easy times. Easy times 
create weak men and weak men create tough times and the cycle will continue. So these people who will roll over, there's someone out there who's going to look after them. And those are the it, people who want to dominate. It's like the, even the collapse of the Roman Empire, they thought that was the end of the world. You know, like mm-hmm. it is, yeah. this has just cyclically happened through history and it is, it is tough uh, to think about that, but you're completely right. Like there, there's this kind of demasculization, de- all of these things. And I do love it when people stand up and go, well, who's going to go to war? You know, and uh, I've seen some feminists on TikTok. I, I literally have to skip past them. They're like, we don't need men to survive. We don't need men to survive. And you're like, like, should, should World War Three? Sure? Yeah, should World War Three tick over? Like, uh, I... I'm not sure if I started watching a bit of Putin's speech the other day uh, where he I think they're like uh, de-escalating their nuclear treaty or something. So things are getting sketchy. Things are getting very sketchy. And all these women on TikTok going, you know, men aren't supposed to be aggressive. They're supposed to be, uh, you know, all of these things. Like you're going to need those hyper-competitive dominant men should, should the war kick off. Yeah, I got on Piers Morgan not so long ago on Twitter. I can't remember what he was. He was talking about we need to we need to we need to de- deploy British troops to Ukraine right now. Oh no, we need to go to Ukraine right now. I think his words were, and I was like, "Who's we? Are you are you, are you going to go?" And Piers, I I think Piers is great, and I've but straight away I'm I'm like, "Who's going?" Because when you say we, who is that? Because there's only going to be a few people who stand up, and that is women and men, and rightly so. And I'm one of the people who pioneered how women can now. And do whatever they want in the British military. We, tr- it wasn't the case that they couldn't do it. It's because we was trained them wrong, which is another thing that I went I went down the lines of ensuring that the people got the correct training. Men and women are built differently. One of the things I did in the Army Foundation College, that I think this is this is five years ago, four or five years ago now, and I think if I did that now, would I get in trouble? And one of the things was uh, utilizing something called the Youth Physical Development Model. Now, there's protected characteristics. One of them we're talking about now is gender. Another one is age. So you can't basically do anything about someone about their age. And I was like, well, I want to treat these people at the Army Foundation College as adolescents because they're 16 and 17. And all my science and research leads to something called um, peak height velocity. And it was basically along the lines of like, it was like a, like legal doping these young men. And it was basically because you go through this thing called a uh, peak height velocity, peak weight velocity, where your testosterone levels go through the roof and it's just after puberty. And I was like, if we do hypertrophy with these boys in that in that window of opportunity, they're going to be stacked. Let's do that. Let's cover those joints that I mentioned before and they'll never get injured. Lo and behold, 100% non in, no injuries. And I was like, that's never been done before. And I was like, I, and I think now, I think, fuck, if I did that with someone go, whoa, 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 whoa. That makes sense. This research is there, but we can't do that. We got to treat it's, everyone the same, and it was different for men and women as well. I had to treat them differently, and that's that's what we've been doing for so long. And I, it's so deflating to know that in times that are coming up, you you saying, okay, women, we're gonna you know work around periodization for the menstrual cycle, and someone's gonna say, why did you say women and menstruation? Don't you mean people or them? And like fucking hell, it. I don't know when I don't know when it finishes, but like you say, rightly so, a seventeen year old is not the same as a twenty seven year old, and a twenty seven year old is not the same as a thirty seven year old. And it's not that you're ageist or discriminatory; it's because you're trying to look after and cater for those demographics. Do you, one of the ways I got this through the door, mate, was I lined them up. I lined a platoon up, a platoon of forty eight people, and I lined them all up on the gym floor and had all the heads shed down and said, "Right, look at all of these people." I said, "That guy on the right has got a better beard than me. His hair's going." He's receding. He's on his way out. He's like, and he's he's sixteen, seventeen. I said, yeah, the guy over there, again, <laughs> the guy on the left, the guy on the left is like a twelve-year-old boy, and I was like, we cannot treat them the same. We can't. And then it was the same with men and women. It was like the girls go through peak height velocity a lot earlier because they start puberty a lot earlier. So that window of opportunity, we've almost missed it. So we have to be very careful about what we do because now there's menstrual cycles. So now we have to have the consideration of that. So they have to be trained differently. And everyone, and at first everyone was like, well, fucking hell, can we, can we talk about this? And I'm just like, this is what science says, let's run with it. And even then, the differences you have between age, I'll never forget uh, playing rugby at under 20s. I'd be a flanker and like, we'd just be setting up for a scrum and I'd look at the referee. I'd be like, what about him? 
And he'd be like, excuse me? I'd be like, look, the number eight, he's got a full grown beard. And he was like, yeah. And I was like, it's under 20s. And he was like, <laughs> and he was looking at me like, what? And I looked at the number eight and I'd say something like, I bet you got a mortgage, didn't you? And he'd be like, excuse me? I'm like, he's got a fucking mortgage and a beard. I was like, he ain't under 20. This guy's at least 30. And I'd just be winding people up in the scrums because the differences between players and their development, every rugby team had their uh, developmental age difference. And then it's different between uh, uh, races as well. When I was in uh, New Zealand playing rugby, uh, I had to do some coaching and I would never forget I had to referee. And I was refereeing, I think it was under 15s or under 14s. And there was a, a team that was predominantly Polynesian. I think they're called Athies or something in Omaru. And these two teams, same age, I looked to the left, massive Polynesian kids. I looked to the right, small, slim, white kids. And I was like, this, this can't be fair. This can't be fair. There's like 10, 15 kilogram advantage to every Polynesian player. And then I see one Polynesian player just mow down this child. And like, I was there, like, refereeing. I was like, oh my God, is that kid okay? And then the cheers that came from the Polynesian families. I was like, this is carnage. This is carnage. Age isn't enough. And because of that, in New Zealand, they've changed it now to do weight. They, uh, their rugby teams are segmented in weight instead of age. So the- Really? Yeah, even if you're it, it, through the school, because this was coming a problem. Like if you've got, uh, you know, Tongan and Samoan kids, and then you've got like uh, Kiwi or English heritage, mm -hmm. whatever, they are going to develop and they're going to be massively different sizes. So for them, one of their biggest things was to actually make their rugby better. Rather than having the massive Tongan kid that was going to bowl through everyone at under 15s, they segmented it into weights like under 80, under 90, or 80 to 90, 90 to 100. So then they'd mix the age levels, but everyone be a similar size, which means they would have to resort to tactics of the game rather than using the big player. I've got a little theory straight off the back of that though. Do you think that people mould to their environment? So these young white kids, as you just mentioned there, are they going to get left behind? Because I'm a fond believer that if you if you continue in that environment, you've got mowed down today, you're going to find a way. You ain't getting mowed down again by that Polynesian guy. He's hit me once, he ain't doing that again because that hurt. So I'm going, I'm going left or right and I need to get quicker. So I'm going to go to the gym and get quicker. You know, do, do, do you think that? Yeah, yeah. I think the, their primary concern is probably safety. Merely just safety, right? So that they, it, as well it's to make sure- the World Cup. Yeah, it's winning by cup. But the, imagine you can mitigate concussions a small amount. But you're completely right because then these Kiwi players come over to the UK. And I actually remembered this. I came back from playing in New Zealand. I came back to the UK. And I looked, I was playing a National 2 game against a club in Reading called Reading Enzians. And I looked at them and there were some big lads. And I was like, there's no Islanders here. I was like, I could go high on all these people and maybe 50-50, I'll pull it off. Before, I knew that I was grabbing a bootlace. When the, when the big Tongan guys come running at me, I was like, if I get hold of a bootlace in one hand and I lose 10 meters, that's fine. But um, yeah, your skill development has to be at that level. And the New Zealand and Australia are actually the same. They have a different type of rugby where they pass the ball very quick and they are very happy for big boys to pass off both hands. In the UK, this could change any rugby fans listening. This was back in my day. In the UK, if a prop stepped in at first receiver, it was a crash ball. It was going up the middle, no matter what. I got to New Zealand, a loose head prop would stand in at fly half cut off the fly half and throw a 40 meter pass off his bad hand. I was like, whoa. So I think those, those skills developments are actually there. And I think it is definitely genetics, but then there's definitely culture where I dropped a high ball in a game and a coach said to me, he was like, he gave me a ball before training. He was like, go off into that field. He was like, kick the ball up in the air and catch it for the next half an hour. He was like, don't drop another high ball, go do that. And um, yeah, I, I loved it out there for that. But they, Imagine this, right? I was in a very small town. It had 10,000 people. It's called Omaru. Three hours north, you've got Christchurch. One and a half hours south, you've got Dunedin. And so out of 10,000 people, we had six rugby teams, which is a lot for 10,000 mm -hmm. people. Then three rugby teams shared the same car park. So you've got three grounds, three pitches, sharing the same car park in a league of six. I was playing for a team called Mahino that have got a, a population of about 60 people in the whole town. So we'd have more people at the rugby club for a game than existed in the town. And we would have to drive over uh, railroad tracks, but there's no, you know, in the UK, you have like barriers and flashing lights yeah. coming down saying, it's just a sign saying, look out for trains. That's it. Perfect. In the South Island of New Zealand, that's all you got. 
you you know, usually you get to a stop road crossing, you look left and right for cars. I'm looking out for trains. So yeah. <laughs> Bit of a tangent. There's there you go. 100%. Have you been to New Zealand? And they're asked about concussions on the rugby field. They want to sort the train tracks out first before they do hey, anything. Fucking. Have you been to New Zealand? No, I've not. I've not. In the South Island, which is the beautiful side where no one lives, there's not even a motorway. The whole South Island of New Zealand has just got like a ring road around it. But, um, but yeah, it was funny also that you said about uh, Staz talking about it in your book because at the International Fitness Summit earlier uh, this year, then last year, Staz was supposed to be doing a workout yeah, and I see you taking the workout and I was like what on earth's going on he didn't make it no he didn't make it man down mate he, um, buddy buddy system I had to step in um, it happens to the best of us yeah, he, he, I think he had a great night um, at, with, with all things said and then but to be honest man I was made up there's nothing I love more in life than training people especially people at that event who want to they want to develop they want to get better um, you know so I just I just gave them what I thought was, was was a lovely workout for them. This is another incredible thing. So you came to the first IFS as an attendee and then the yep. next event, you're a speaker, a very popular speaker at that. And you'll be speaking again this year in September? Yeah, well, hopefully. I, I, if that's an invite, mate, then 100%. I, I absolutely I thought, loved it, mate. I don't do the invites, but I'm almost certain that you're on the roster. Have, has anyone contacted yeah. you yet? Yeah, I've, so I've, I've, been, I've, been, I've been spoken about it, but it's... Um, I didn't know whether that was whether you released it or not. Yeah, we're not we're not doing it. Are, we're not doing it without you. Nah, that'd be good, mate. I want to I want to um, I want to train more people as well, mate. We're down in uh, lovely Brighton, mate. Utilize the beach. Nothing. Oh yeah. Nothing better. Get get me involved, mate. Get me. Inv- I'll um, I'll train more people. Let's do a nice talk. They're, that's easy work, but you know, really training people and getting people. That's what they're there for, aren't they? Give them a little. Bro, I want to get I want to get some jujitsu mats this year. And like lay some yeah, jiu-jitsu yeah, nice. mats down, do some like fundamentals with people, teach them stuff. Because Stad's got his blue belt now. Alima's got his blue belt. Duran's got his yeah. purple belt. Sven, uh, Sven, I'm not sure if Sven's got his blue belt. He might do, but he'll. We're, we're going to have like a, a good little bunch, and then you're going to have. We're going to have all of you physically more competent athletes than us, and then we get to bring you to a domain with soft mats where potentially we can have the upper hand. Yeah. Nice man. No, I, I, I 100% mate. I'd love to. So I remember going down and watching. Uh, as an attendee on the on the first one, and that was when I was just leaving the military. In fact, I was still in. I was still I was still in, and I I think I got some leave to go down and and do it. Mate, I loved it, and I thought, you know, I can do that. Um, fortunately enough, I got asked for the next one, and and loved every minute of it, mate. And um, yeah, can't I can't wait to do it again. I think it's first weekend or second weekend in September. But for anyone listening, I'll put a link in the description. So not only your book, uh, your website, I also put in the link to International Fitness Summit. I also want to talk about the socks. Thank you very much for sending me uh, some pairs of those. They're very good. I took the dog for a walk in them last night. Talk me through, you know, uh, the reason behind, the story behind these socks. So in the military, our most practiced asset is our feet. If it goes down, no one gives a fuck how fit you are. Trench foot. It's irrelevant. Yeah, you're irrelevant. You become nothing. So you look after your feet as best as you possibly can. And we always spend hundreds of pounds on boots and I was creating these absolute monsters predominantly to go on special forces selection and and one and one, one of them one of the lads was struggling with blisters and I was like fuck and it was the same as well as when I was in Harrogate I was thinking you know, blisters this guy's a monster and blisters are holding him back I was like it's got to be something got to be something we can do and so I thought do you know what I'll look into it I started studying feet uh, randomly enough as I do and Came up with the idea, you know, I'm gonna, I'll create socks. I'll send this guy some socks. And then um, before I'll do that, I'll run in it and just went fully in on it. And you know, and you add science to something that we all always take for granted and you put a lot of time and effort into it and big things happen. There was, a, there was an absolute gap in the market. I ran at it, military grade socks. So they're as good wet as they are dry. And you know, it's, it was, there's padded in the right place. There's, um, you know, there's, the sweat can never accrue at the top. And I then had targeted compression, so not full compression, like most socks try and go down. It's too tight, they're not nice. So there's actually targeted compression in the Achilles tendon to basically act the same as the Achilles, elastic energy, only the energy stored outside your body. Um, and I just ran at it and I went with it and it, it, it absolutely blew up. Um, and, 
you know, and that's why I was, I was as we were talking on IFS, you know, I was saying I, I'm now the sock dog. I took it from the night guy shoe dog. I, I'm the sock dog now. And randomly enough, one of my businesses is socks and it just went bigger and bigger and it's still growing now, mate. I, my phone's blowing up now with people buying socks. It's just crazy. And they <laughs> are very, dog. very good socks. But you know what's very interesting about this? A friend of mine, we didn't fall out. He would, yeah, he'd probably say we've fallen out. He, uh, he just released a pair of socks and... I said to him, There's, I don't understand the brand. And I said to him, you're, you're selling a what? You're not selling a why? And I had another conversation with a guy a couple of weeks ago. He was wearing a nice Rolex. And I said to him, I like your watch. And he goes, yeah, I bought it for myself after 12 months being sober. And I thought, having a why behind something is the key component as to why you'll be successful. And the fact we speak about your socks, there was a problem. You created a solution you brought the solution to market because like you say, I've seen some of the hardest people in the world rule themselves out from sport for having an ingrown toenail, <laughs> let alone blisters. It's the little things that take the big people down. 100%. And I want to talk about the success of this business. So who are the demographic that are buying these stocks now? Predominantly, it began as tactical organizations, um, those serving, those who work in boots, uh, pretty much. And over time, it's grown. Not the store, where- by the way, not the store, not the pharmacy. Yeah, so it uh, and over time it's just it's just grown significantly. And uh, I was at the I was supposed to deliver a talk at the Arnold's, and there was a CrossFit competition there, and I'm watching the CrossFit at the final, and I'm watching them get the, the get their award at the end. And the woman who won their final was wearing the socks, and I was like, that's crazy. And um, it's just grown arms and legs of people playing golf. I've seen tennis players you know it's 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 just gone it's just gone bigger and bigger and bigger and it's 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 anyone who spends any prolonged period of time on their feet but my demographic was soldiers and it all started with a why as you say the first chapter in my book is find your why and the first question i ask when anyone wants to come onto a coaching plan is why why do you want this and it's again going back to as i mentioned before it's finding that why is the most single most important thing of everything as you just said you're selling the what not a why it's it's you're going to fall down. Um, and it was really important to me. And like you say, I, I, I saw a little gap. I ran with it. I brought out like 100 pairs of socks. I sold them out in three minutes. So I doubled the order, got the factory to make more, changed things slightly, bought 200, sold them out in literally a few minutes again. And I was like, fucking hell, am I doing this? So I doubled the order again, just put all the money straight back in. I spent a lot of money on science and research and then doubled it. And sold them out again, like 12 hours or something. I was like, fuck, am I, this is actually happening. Like, well, what can I do? There's nothing more I can do but feed the market. And I was just like, I just, I just kept going with it. And I've molded them and changed them ever so slightly um, with small little, small little twinges. But yeah, it's just great. It's grown into a very healthy business now. And something I never had a clue I would ever do. I, I still find it weird. I tell people I sell socks. Um, you know, I, I normally keep it quiet, to be fair. It's a really poor marketing strategy, but... And it's really hard to sell an item like a sock, but it's also really good in, it's effectively an underwear. And one of the reasons I can go to market with it and do really well from it is because it can go through your letterbox and it can't be returned because it's an underwear. So shipping and returns are down. And it's just like, I just found it really, really interesting, really easy. And I was just like, keep going. Joy, it's, it. it's crazy that so many people are on the cusp of a, uh, they're on the cusp of something that's going to change their life forever and they don't know what it is yet. This is one of the most like exciting and beautiful things about life where you've got a very successful career. You you got an award from the Queen, didn't you? Yeah, I was on the Queen's yeah. birthday's honours list in 2019. All these things, right? And if you could get a very smart person to go, what's, what's going to be his breakaway thing? And they're going to go, well, it's probably going to be his S&C stuff, probably going to be his training plans, probably going to be the fact he works with MMA athletes, probably going to be this, probably going to be that. And then out of nowhere, boom, good socks. And like so many people out there might be working in a fringe profession, whether they're a fucking vet or they're a fucking tennis star or whatever. And then suddenly they're going to create one small thing. Like look at Whoop. It was a heart rate monitor that didn't even have a fucking screen on it. You know, all of these different like things. I feel like people are so close to potentially coming out with something very innovative that's very successful. May I ask you, you can you don't have to answer this. How many pairs of socks have you sold to date? Over ten thousand. It's incredible. That's- yeah, it's um I I'm a very I so I, I 
I'm also I own a tech company and I teamed up with one of the world's leading sports technology companies to build my app and to build um, an artificial intelligence coaching platform that's being sold back into the military. And one of the fir- one of the things he's always told me um, from an engineering point of view was get your product off the table because if you don't do it, someone else will. And in engineering and in technology, things move that quickly is that if you're still pissing about and moving things and, and making slight adjustments on your computer or whatever it is, there's going to be some whiz kid who comes in and goes, I've made it. There you go. And before and as that touches the ground, someone else has got something new. There's a new update. There's something new. So his fond belief was get your product off the table. So I was like, ah, oh, do you know what? I'm going to run. I've, I've, done, I've sent it back so many times. I'm going to run with it. And yeah, I got the product off the table. There was a few things I wanted to change. Changed them. Doubled the order. Sold. Kept doubling. Kept doubling. And it's still to this day just selling. And it comes back down to they're actually decent socks and everyone needs a decent pair of socks. And it's, you know, and you would, and I, and the, one of the things I, I said is t- uh, three of the hardest courses in the military is the is P company, the commando course and special forces hills, the hills part of special forces selection. And I was like, can you imagine just before you go on the commando course, if I said, I can guarantee you'll never get a blister and your feet will be just as good wet as they are dry. How much would you pay for that? And then someone would would snap your hand off because your feet are in rag for the whole time. They're in disarray for the whole time. And I was like, and I can guarantee you won't get a blister. I'd pay, I'd pay, for, I'd pay a grand for that. It's, it's insane because uh, you're completely right. And one of the things that I'm like super anal about in my life is like underwear and socks. So uh, I'm not sure if you've ever used Lululemon men's, men's underwear. Mm-hmm. The, the day I tried them on, I shit you not, for the last five and a half years, I've never worn a pair of Calvins, never worn a pair of anything else apart from Lula. I went to the store and I, and this isn't endorsed. They, they said I swear too much to ever even endorse me for anything. <laughs> cool people cunts apparently it doesn't go well with the yoga brand, but I, I went to the store and I bought like 15 pairs of underwear and I was like, that's me. And every time if you get old or the dog bites hole in them, I chuck them out and get a new pair. But to me, if I was to go somewhere without that pair of underwear, like my day's almost ruined because they don't ride up your crutch so if yeah. i put on a pair of calvins i start riding up i'm like oh, fuck this shit but also socks now the best ankle socks in the world so i'm not going to try and put you out of business here the best ankle socks in the world are from a store in australia called general pants and they've got this tiny little like rubbery bit behind the heel that stops the heel slipping but yeah just the way they're put together you can put them in the dry and they work well and even Darren, when he comes here the, on his last day he'll go and he'll buy like 12 15 pairs of these socks because having a bad pair of socks will ruin your day and often what do, if you ever see me wearing like tennis socks it's because one i'm doing something that i'm sweating a lot in but two i cannot afford for a sock to come down if i'm going to go play a game of tennis or i'm going to go for a run or i'm going to do go for a long walk if your stock socks start slipping down and you start sending up under your shoe it does your oh. head in and now add you know 30 kg on your back you're in big trouble you know so and you're over the hills and you're wet and you've got another 10 clicks to go you're in big big trouble so it's my demographic was predominantly soldiers and but then people realized external of that that as you just said walking the dog i still need a decent pair of socks and it's and and i my biggest we are in the top one percent on shopify for return buyers so those who have bought one pair of socks have and before the arnold so i sold a lot to a different demographic before the arnold we had a hundred percent return buy rate 100 percent and that was on thousands of pairs of socks. People was coming and going, one, buying one pair, I'll check them out, buying a pair of socks, you know, and then they would come back and buy three or four pairs. You've got and this inquisitive like, right. thing now. You're going to have a lot of listeners going, what the fuck? Oh, fucking hell, I've got to get a pair of these. What's the brand name? Red On Socks. So everything I do has, the start is called Red On. Now Red Same On the is book. the right... Red on Revolution's the book. My app's the Red on Challenge. Everything I do is got is Red on, and it's that's the light you see before you leave the aircraft as a paratrooper, and it's all to do with prepping. Everyone considers the green light is the most important. So when the green light comes on, you leave the aircraft, and you know you 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 you're airborne. The red light's the most important. The red light can be anything in life. It's not just that red light for leaving the aircraft. Your red light could be um, the whistle before your football game. You know, it's it's anything. It's building up to that moment and being ready for anything in that moment. You're ready on the red. So when green light comes on, you're good to go. And that's how I take everything into consideration. All my coaching is whatever happens, 
will be ready and that's the most important so that's why everything starts with red on that's it i hope this episode bolsters a, a few more uh pairs of socks because you could tell it's just such a thoughtful thing and like you say John, a lot of my mates i've got like shit socks or shit underwear and it's one of the main things i get them or if i've got girlfriends that are like oh it's my it's my friend's birthday or it's my i'm like get him a pair of these undies and they're like no i want to get him something proper i'm like you'll change this fucking guy's life <laughs> right you will change his life the technology is called anti-ball crushing right have it I'll, i might have to send you a few 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 pairs over to the uk but like it's it's this little thing that we kind of overlook with something so flipping trivial like having a good pair of shoes or whatever yeah. um so you you've got you know, i was i've seen the ai thing on your app actually because you've got that what tier one tier two or is it grade one grade two what do you call it so uh, tier one and tier two so um yeah so i i own an artificial intelligence coaching platform it's now considered legally as ai so it's it's machine learning whereby i created a few algorithms uh whilst i was not whilst I was serving for legal reasons. It wasn't whilst I was serving. I created a few algorithms that were, um, I could work out the exact amount of resistance you can put through the majority of muscles within your body by taking a few simple measurements. I could then work out other measurements that would basically say, and I hypothesized years ago that if you can shoulder press this, I reckon you can bicep curl this. What are the synergists? What are the fixators? What the, what's the agonist and antagonist in those movements? And I ran away with it and just did shitloads of research and, and development on it and came up with loads of algorithms, turned it into an AI that it talks to each other and then I built an app off the back of it. And um, and yeah, that's gone crazy as well. Sick. That sounds good. That sounds... So you got you got fucking robots doing your work. You got yeah. top tier athletes on your program. You got socks flying off shelves. You got your audio book that's coming out in hard copy next year. Uh, it'll be this year now, but officially it's... I, it's, I keep forgetting what on, year it is, mate. I keep yeah, forgetting what year. Oh, mate, I know. So it's, a, it's a, exclusively on, as an audio now. Predominantly people get an Audible. Um, I think it might... I don't know if it is still uh, number one for uh, health and fitness or exercise and fitness, um, which is pretty cool. It's a nice nice place to be. And and yeah, so things are going well, mate. The tech company is the best thing ever, mate. We, we're programming some of the most elite people in the world, like from celebrities to some of like national athletes and I've got the, I've got a tech team behind me I just sat there at seven in the morning like scoffing <laughs> scoffing crisps and, and downing coke and that and I'm just like this is great developers though they, they cost oh. a lot of money oh, worth the weight in gold mate yeah but of course we must have a different development team we must <laughs> I'll introduce you I'll mine. introduce you mate I'm pretty sure mine are billing me to talk to each other in the same office Man, I can remember being sat in the office when I first met them and they uh, they both got their headphones on. Bearing in mind, these people are very educated and they're, they're sat about two metres opposite each other, screaming at each other and couldn't work out why they couldn't hear each other. And I was just sat there looking at them thinking, what the, what the fuck's going on here? I thought, these, I, thought this was, I thought this was the A team. I thought this was the best team. And I thought, oh my God, we're going to fail. <laughs> we're going to fail if drastically. Want, if you want to know about people, right, the most important thing you can realise is that if you have a set of skills in one place, it means you've, you're lacking them in another. Today, when we started this, you could say I've sold three Sunday Times number one best-selling books. I put a different time in my calendar than I did message you. I messaged you saying 7.30. I went to Google Calendar and put it in at eight. I put it in at eight, I swear to God. And this is it. So then I was like, oh, I want to make sure that I'm not late for this morning. I put it in 8 a.m. And there's me going, I'm nah. saying to you, I'm like, you're mental, mate. It's, like, it's 8 a.m. You go, oh, have you snoozed? I'm like, snoozed, you cheeky bastard. <laughs> if you have skills in one place, they're lacking in another. I do, I sometimes do the stupid shit. I was competing in jiu-jitsu, which I love. I was looking at the wrong score on the scoreboard and I let the guy win because I thought I was up. There are some things, and this will help people, right? These guys, you're writing program and code and AI and all of this. They're so smart, but they can't hold eye contact when they're having a conversation. So whenever, yeah. this is my main takeaway for anyone listening. Whenever you meet an idiot, they're a genius in something. 100%. Man, I, know, I know guys in the Paris who can't read or write, but will drop mortar bombs from 2K away on someone, on a pinpoint someone. And they're playing with these little, little action things and they're dropping bombs somewhere else. I'm like... How can you do that? People are like measuring wind and stuff for snipers, and I'm thinking that guy can't read. <laughs> <laughs> he's just dropping people. He's dropping people from miles away, and I'm like, that guy can't read, and he's, he's he's judging the wind. He's like smelling leaves and stuff, and tracking people down in the jungle. I'm like, 
the fuck's going on? That would be a clip for a clip for TikTok. Uh, what <laughs> what's the future holding for you? What you got on for the rest of the year apart from IFS? Uh, similar to you, I'm actually just about to open uh, my own little gym. It's not. I'm, I'm bringing all my businesses I just mentioned into one place. Um, so I'm opening the first Tactical Athlete Performance Center. Uh, stolen, not stolen for legal reasons from the UFC Performance Institute in Vegas. Pretty much bringing that style over into the tactical world and bringing everything into one place. All my online stuff. My I'll have my own gym there for, my, for me and my staff to be able to go and work out every day. Um, socks are going to go from there and everything's just going to come under one roof Um, because at the moment it's everywhere I've got offices everywhere and I'm like I need to bring it all together so that's the most important that's happening in the next four to six weeks while that's going through so you've just um, just opened your gym haven't you? Yeah so basically we uh, I live in Bondi at the moment and in the city we had like an office and we thought when we were going to hire staff that we need an office in the middle of Sydney but it just turns out that we don't so um, I'm moving down the coast I won't point which way just in case people know I don't want them knowing which way I'm moving down the coast uh, I'm moving about an hour out of Sydney because one I can just afford to open a gym there I can't Actually. afford to open a gym here without having 80 members but down there we've opened a gym for ourselves we made like an office space out of it where what I love is I can write an email go downstairs do a set of bench press and then I'll have an idea and I'll be like oh fuck I wanted to order something on Amazon I run upstairs I'm there and I'm like oh fuck but then sometimes mate I'm having six minutes rest between sets and I'm performing well. Like, mm. I'm not worried about getting cold or anything like that. And then I'm working out some programs. And like, even, do you know the beauty of being able to struggle with a set and pull a face? Like, I've been pulling some ugly faces. You know, when you get to that RPE nine out of 10 and I'm looking yeah. like, and I'm like, there's no one's here to see it. I can do whatever I want. I can even grunt for the first time lifting weights when I'm struggling. So when you have that own gym, it's beautiful. And also I've just been trying out new shit. Where, yeah, nice, mate. And, and it's such a beautiful thing because when you become well-known in your field for training, you actually become like quite worried about trying new shit in case someone's filming you, right? Someone's yeah, like, oh, yeah. that, there's that coach Mike Chadwick. Oh yeah, film. what the fuck's he doing? What is that? Oh, I get that on the internet. Oh, he doesn't know what he's doing. So like um, having your own having your own place is amazing. You get like your own equipment and like even little things. I used to love using fat grips back in the day for grip training. I've now yeah. got a little storage facility. I've got my fat grips, I've got my chalk, I've nice. got all of this stuff. Mate, you'll be like a kid in the playground. It's the best thing ever. And, and bringing your businesses together to be able to talk to people whilst you're training. Hey, what's going on for Q1? What are we doing with the email marketing of this? How are we doing all of these things? Uh, yeah, I'm excited and I'm actually moving house to be three minutes away from my new gym, uh, primarily Amazing, because, of, yeah, pr- primarily because of the dog. I'll, you think you get a dog, but the dog gets you. And yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. You think you're the boss. You're, you're not. The dog is the boss of you. And the dog has been saying to me, he, he wants a garden and he wants a bit more space. So, uh, yeah, going to be doing that. And, uh, I'll, I'll have to come up and train at this facility. You're going to have any, any mats? in this new facility uh there's no space potentially so that we've got we've got the ability to extend so potentially we can move into that so i obviously i work with some mma athletes who will, will if i if i have to fulfill that need i'll do it um predominantly i would like to sp- I'm, a, I'm a very fond believer of staying in my lane um i'm qualified in nutrition but i'm not the best so i'm bringing in the number one in the country and he's going to come and work with me and in that under the roof all day he's a he got a phd in uh nutrition and performance so i want to basically just talk to him all day to teach me all day i just want him to like talk and then let's go and train why are we doing that and implement theory into practice do loads of research from there and and just as you say mate just have my own space and go and hold myself accountable where my desk is two minutes it's five minutes away from my house as well same i've got kids so it's exactly the same as you having a dog mate they rule the roost and it's, really it's so good for content as well. You have a content That's idea, you just pull the camera out, leave a camera yeah. out, leave your mic out. Um, I mean, Stephen, when you're talking about fitness stuff, just having gym plates in the background, it makes all the difference. 100%, mate. Well, very exciting stuff. Uh, I'm glad that we managed to get this podcast properly done, properly produced. Uh, it's come at a good time because this time you've got the book behind you and you've come a long way with uh, everything that's going on. Uh, I know I'll be seeing you uh, in September. If I'm back home and we're in similar places, probably me in Liverpool. Uh, is that where you're opening? This place is in Liverpool, mate. Yeah. So if I'm up that way, I'll be I'll be swinging by. 
I'll be coming in the door with nine square meters of mats under my arm saying, uh, you Pleasure, know, mate. But um, mate, it's been it's been great to chat. Is there anything that you want to specifically point people to? If I was you, I would definitely push a, a sock promotion. Ah, it's all right, mate. That that will that will come with it. You know, you people can find oh, me if you've got any questions. Cell. on... He's done the sock quest- cell. Yeah, don't worry about that, mate. Um, if anyone's got any questions from a physical development standpoint, uh, predominantly I specialise in tactical athlete development, but we do branch out. Obviously, I spoke about the MMA people. You can find me at Coach Mike Chadwick. All the links for the socks and the app, the book, will all be within that. But um, that's where you'll find me. And I'm, I'm more than happy to to answer any questions and just talk about health and fitness. It's what my life is and I, I love nothing more than talking about it. So get on me and I'll be there. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on and having a chat. Absolute pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me.